Hello, everyone. Today, Yang and I will be giving an introduction and update to Kubernetes Six Storage. My name is Xin Yang. I work at a VMware at the Cloud Storage team. I'm a co-chair of Kubernetes Six Storage, along with Sada Ali from Google. And I am Jan Schafranek, working for Red Hat, and I am tech lead together with Michelle O from Google. So here is today's agenda. First, we'll talk about what is Six Storage. Then we will talk about what we did in 1.20 and 1.21 releases. We will talk about what we are working on for the future and talk about cross seek working groups and projects. Finally, we will talk about how to get involved. So what is Six Storage? Six Storage is a special interest group that focuses on how to provide storage to pods in your Kubernetes cluster. Six Storage's scope is in the storage control plane. It provides a way for containers in the pods to consume block of file storage. This can be persistent long-term storage that lives beyond the pods lifecycle, or it can be ephemeral temporary storage, which becomes available when the pod is started and goes away when the pod goes down. Six storage is responsible for the life cycle of volumes used by pods. This includes provisioning a new volume, attaching a volume to the node and mounting it so that pod can use it, unmounting, detaching and deleting the volume when it is no longer needed, taking snapshots so that it can be used to restore the volume if the original volume is corrupted for some reason. Six storage also looks at how to influence the scheduling decisions based on topology information to see whether the storage is accessible to a node and make sure volume is scheduled to a node which can have access to the storage. Also, Six Storage is responsible for managing storage capacity, managing quota based on the capacities or number of resources and provides ability to expand volume if a volume runs low in space. Six storage owns the persistent volume and persistent volume claim feature. This allows storage vendor to create a volume and persistent data in the volume, which can be pre preserved even if the pod goes away. We have the storage class concept. A storage class provides a way for administrators to describe the classes of storage they offer. Different classes might map to different quality of service levels. In dynamic provisioning, storage class is used to find out which provisioner should be used and what parameters should be passed to the provisioner when creating the volume. Six Storage has been working on migrating from in-tree volume plugins to auto-tree CSI drivers. New features are only added to CSI drivers. Other than persistent volumes, there are also ephemeral volumes. Ephemeral volume is specified directly in a pod spec, it's mounted on the pod as a directory. Data can be stored in a file under that directory. Ephemeral volumes include secrets, config maps, and generic ephemeral volumes and so on. Its life cycle follows the life cycle of a pod. So that's a brief introduction of Six Storage. Next, I will talk about what we did in the 1.20 release. In 1.20, CSI snapshot feature moved to GA. A snapshot represents a point in time copy of a volume. It can be used as a data source to create a new volume. This feature provides a basic building block for supporting data protection in Kubernetes. Backup vendors are standardizing on CSI snapshot APIs to build their backup solutions. CSI snapshot feature has Kubernetes volume snapshot CRDs or snapshot controller and a validation webhook. Those should be bundled and deployed by the Kubernetes cluster distro. There's also an external snapshot sidecar that is deployed together with the CSI driver. In 1.20, um, there are also uh, two FS group related features moved to beta. The first one is non-recursive volume ownership. 
This feature allows users to skip recursive permission changes when mounting a volume. Traditionally, if your pod is running as a non-root user, you must specify an FS group inside the pod's security context so that the volume can be readable and writable by the pod. However, there is a downside. Each time a volume is mounted, Kubernetes must recursively change or change mode all the files and directories inside the volume. This can be very expensive for larger volumes with, with a lot of uh, small files. This could cause pod startup time to be very slow. Uh, with this uh, beta feature in Kubernetes 1.20, we are providing a way to opt out of recursive permission changes if the volume already has the correct permissions. The second one uh, is a CSR driver policy for FS group. The CSR driver now has a FS group uh, field, which allows storage drivers to explicitly opt in or out of the recursive modifications. This way, Kubernetes can avoid needless modification attempts. This optim optimization helps to reduce volume on time. Uh, there is a default policy called read write once with a FS type. It is applied if a no FS group policy is defined. This preserves the behavior from previous Kubernetes releases. In Wanda 20, we also added a new feature called a, a pass pop service account token to CSI. This provides a way to obtain service account token for parts that the CSI drivers are mounting volumes for. Uh, since these tokens are valid only for a limited period, this feature also gives the CSI drivers an option to re-execute node publish volume to mount volumes. So this is what we did in 1.20. Next, I will talk about what we did in 1.21 release. In uh, 1.21 release, uh, we have this uh, immutable secrets and config maps moved to GA. This feature allows users to specify the contents of a particular secret or config map that should be immutable for the lifetime of the object. For such secrets and config map, kubelets will not watch oh, for changes to updated amounts for their pods so that will reduce the load on the API server. It also enables users to better protect themselves against accidental bad updates uh, that could cause outages. In 1.21, uh, CSI Windows also targets GA. So uh, Windows containers can be privileged but CSI drivers need to perform privileged operations such as mount. So we have a CSI proxy binary that runs directly on the host uh, and performs all the privileged, privileged operations. CSI drivers communicate to proxy through a gRPC interface. We also have a few feature that moved to beta in 1.21. So we have a storage capacity tracking that becomes a, a beta feature. Traditionally, the Kubernetes scheduler was based on the assumption that additional persistent volume, uh, additional persistent storage uh, is available everywhere in the cluster and has infinite capacity. Topology constraints addressed this uh, first problem, but without this feature, part scheduling was still done without considering that the remaining storage capacity may not be enough to start a new pod. The storage capacity tracking addresses that by adding an API for a CSR driver to report storage capacity and uses that information in the Kubernetes scheduler when choosing a node for a pod. And we also have a generic ephemeral volumes feature moved to beta. Kubernetes provides volume plugins whose lifecycle is tied to a pod and can be used as a scratch space, such as the built-in empty dirt volume type, or to load some data to a pod, such as the built-in config map and secret volume types or CSI inline volumes. The generic ephemeral volumes feature allows any existing storage driver that supports 
dynamic provisioning to be used as an ECMO volume. With the volume slab cycle bumped to the pod, it can be used to provide scratch storage that is different from the root disk. For example, persistent memory or a separate local disk on that node. All storage class parameters for volume provisioning are supported. All features supported with PVCs are also supported, such as storage capacity tracking, snapshots and restore, and volume resizing. In Vendor 21, we also have the passport service account token to CSI feature moved to beta. As mentioned earlier, this was just introduced as an alpha feature in 1.20. We also have a Azure file CSI migration moved to beta in 1.21. We also have a couple of alpha features in 1.21. The first one is CSI volume health monitoring. This was first introduced as an alpha feature in 1.19 release. In 1.21, we did a second alpha due to a design change where we moved the volume health monitoring logic from an external agent to Kubelet. This feature enables CSI drivers to share abnormal volume conditions from the underlying storage system with Kubernetes so that they can be reported as events on PVCs or pods. This feature uh, serves as a stepping stone towards programmatic decision um, a resolution of individual voting house issues by Kubernetes. And we also have this uh, um, prioritizing nodes based on volume capacity feature. Um, that is a new alpha feature in 1.21. Without this feature, Kubernetes didn't take uh, volume capacity into account when scheduling a pod that can run in multiple topologies. A large PV may be used by a PVC with a small capacity request, even if there are many suitable small PVs in other topologies. PVCs with a large capacity request may not find feasible PVs to use if too many large PVs are consumed by PVCs with a small capacity request. With this feature, the scheduler takes volume capacity into account in scheduling parts to ensure balanced resource usage. So this prioritizes nodes based on the best matching size of statically provisioned PVs. So this is what we did in 1.21. Now I'm going to hand it over to Yang to talk about our future plans. Uh, thank you, Xing. So as six storage, we keep track of our features in a planning sheet. And during Kubernetes 1.21 development, we had 40 features. So in the list below, uh, I have just the most notable ones for the next release. Uh, we are graduating CSI migration towards GA. Here we basically remove all the entry code we have in Kubernetes for cloud providers and redirect all the storage operations to CSI drivers under the hood. So it should be invisible to users. Uh, you will be able to use the same PVs, PVCs, storage classes as you use today but uh, all the storage operation will be done by uh, CSI drivers instead of Kubernetes. Right now we have all cloud-based volume plugins deprecated in Kubernetes and CSI migration is in beta, but it is off by default for the most cloud providers. Uh, the only one enabled by default in Kubernetes 121 is OpenStack Cinder. In Kubernetes 122, we want to have CSI migration on by default for most of the other cloud providers. And finally, in uh, Kubernetes 123, 24, we would like to have the CSI migration GA and finally remove all the entry volume plugins. Uh, another feature we are graduating for some time is volume expansion. It is in beta, it is in beta for a long time uh, and it works pretty well. However, there are still some nasty corner cases we need to iron out. And then we have a number of features in design and prototyping phase. Again, only, only the most interesting ones here below. Uh, recovery from volume expansion failures is one huge corner case 
of volume expansion. So it got the feature on its own. And as you know, Kubernetes, it retries after a failure. So it tries to reach the requested state, which in this case is a big volume. But if a user, for example, asks for two big volumes, like exabytes, the storage backend is probably going to reject the expansion. And again and again, as Kubernetes tries to re resize, then the storage backend will, will uh, reject it. And at the same time, we don't allow users to shrink volumes. So this user is basically stuck because uh, they will not get those exabytes they asked for, but they cannot cancel the operation at the same time. So in this feature, we are trying to allow users to cancel a failed expansion in a safe and without races. Um, another feature is volume groups. And uh, we want to allow users to put their persistent volume claims into higher level groups. And this will allow interesting features like taking snapshot of a whole group as, as a whole at the same time. Uh, because with snapshots we have today, you can take snapshots of a single PVC. And if you want to take snapshot of more of them, then you need to do it one by one. And uh, they will be taken at a different time, basically. So with volume groups, you could take the snapshot of a whole group at the same time. Uh, generic data, uh, generic volume populators expands on an idea we introduced with volume cloning and restoring snapshots. In the early days of Kubernetes, uh, newly dynamically provisioned volumes were, were always empty. And today with cloning and snapshots, you can pre-populate a volume with either content of a different volume, that's the cloning, or with a restored snapshot. And data populators, uh, with data populators, anybody could write a piece of code that can pre-populate a volume during dynamic provisioning with virtually anything. For example, uh, it, the populator could clone a Git repository or put there a content of container image or a virtual machine image or basically whatever. We had volume populators in Kubernetes since Kubernetes 1.18. And in 122, the API should be complete and in beta. Uh, container object storage interface is an attempt to bring object storage like Amazon S3 to Kubernetes pods. It has been in design phase for quite some time. There is a spe special work group for that. And now uh, we are finishing the API and trying to go alpha in the next release in Kubernetes 122. And finally, we are trying to allow users to move PVCs and volume snapshots among namespaces in a safe method manner uh, and without races, which is, again, harder than it may seem. And it will take some time until we uh, implement this feature. And next slide, please. So together with other six, uh, we are working on data protection, uh, which got its own work group on its own. Here we are expanding on work volume snapshots again. And right now, right now, if you take a snapshot of a single volume, the application it can be still running. So there can be a pod or writing to the volume at the same time we take the snapshot. Uh, like most applications like databases can recover from uh, partly uh, written uh, data. If you restore the snapshot, then you can see only part of the data written. So the databases can usually recover from that, but it's not ideal. So in this work group, we are trying to add uh, some hooks into pods. So uh, uh, when taking a snapshot, we could poke the pod to flush the caches and transactions and everything, and possibly freeze the file system. Then we can take the snapshot and then resume the application. So the snapshot will be consistent from the application point of view. And when this 
is combined with the volume groups I covered before, you could take a snapshot of a whole stateful set and the snapshot could be guaranteed to be consistent. So this was the application side of backups, while change block tracking helps with the backend side. So we, a backup software could do a diff between two snapshots and get the list of uh, changed blocks between these two snapshots. So it could take a backup only of those backup, uh, only of those changed blocks uh, to speed up uh, the backup and to save some storage capacity and also transfer bandwidth. Together with SIG apps, we are improving stateful sets to allow expansion of their volumes and also to optionally delete persistent volume claims uh, after you scale down a stateful set. Because right now, if you stay scaled a stateful set down, it will leave the volumes behind and it's up to, use, to the user to delete them manually. And finally, together with SIG node, we are trying to recover volumes from shutdown nodes better. Uh, currently, when a node becomes unavailable from whatever reason, uh, Kubernetes will not detach volumes from that node because the node can be still running, um, just it may not be able to talk to the API server. So detaching such volumes would corrupt the volumes because they are still mounted on the node. But what if uh, we know that the node is shut down? Uh, if the node is shut down, then the volumes are not mounted, we are pretty sure. And we can detach the volumes and we can attach them somewhere else. So the pods that use the volume can be rescheduled to the other nodes and your application can resume much quicker than today. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the features. Now, how to get involved with SIG storage. On the top, you can see a link to our homepage with all the details about the SIG, our meeting times, notes from the last meetings, list of GitHub repositories, uh, sub projects, Slack channels, mailing list, and so on. Uh, we have several meetings per week dedicated to individual sub projects but the main meeting is every other Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, we go there uh, through our features planned for the current release, and we can also discuss uh, details and even pull requests. It's open for everybody to hesitate to join, and if you have a topic you want to be discussed by the SIG, then please add it to the agenda. Uh, some people prefer to read the code. So if you are interested in how storage works, uh, you can read uh, code in many of our uh, GitHub repositories. You can uh, list the issues uh, that people report on GitHub and you can submit your code. Uh, it may be hard to find the right place where the code lives because like, as I said, we have many repositories. Uh, just ask on Slack and we can direct you the right way. Uh, we use labels on issues to flag issues that are easy to fix. That's the good first issue label or where we need help from the community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I already mentioned our uh, features tracking spreadsheet. So you can see what we are working on. And if you find anything interesting there, don't be afraid to contact the feature owner directly. Again, ask on Slack when you are not sure. Uh, if you want to contribute a whole new feature, then please join our bi-weekly meeting. A new feature can be added at any time and uh, we will guide you through the process. We don't have any specific process for new features. We just follow the generic Kubernetes one. So you will need to create a tracking issue. Uh, so others, other people can know that there is a feature in progress being developed. And you will need to write the Kubernetes enhancement proposal, CAP in short, and shepherd it through various reviews and through alpha, beta, and GA phases. Uh, don't be afraid 
uh, and again, yeah, we are here to help you with those uh, processes. Uh, we are always interested in new contributors. Uh, every little pull request counts. It doesn't need to be a whole new feature. You can improve our documentation, add unit tests, add E2E -E tests, or do some minor refactoring if you see that the, the code is ugly. It's up to you. And uh, your contribution will be always welcome. And next slide, please. Yeah, so we are at the end of our talk. Uh, here is a list of other storage-related talks at this KubeCon. Uh, most of them actually were yesterday, so at least you can watch the recordings. And thanks for watching, and we are here to answer your questions.